morning. I will now call the December 2nd meeting of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife meeting to order. My name is Angie Vox. I have the privilege of serving as chairman of this commission. And at this time, I'd like to ask um, Commissioner Cox to lead us an invocation and a pledge. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. At this time, I'd like to welcome all of our guests and visitors. December 2nd, Merry Christmas. We've got uh, lots of guests here that we're happy to have y'all. Uh, I've got Andrea White with ACA here. Uh, Dave Rizzuto, CWA. Hello, Dave. Uh, Robin Pope. Hey. Clay Young with American Caviar, glad to have you. Pam Moore Morphis. Hi, Pam. Uh, Scott Fisher, ACA, and we have uh, special guests here that are wives and significant others of the TWA employees that are receiving awards. So I'd like to recognize them as well. Kim Bean, Kim, hi Kim, thanks for being here. Connie Habra, hi Connie. Kathy West, hi Kathy. Julie Reeves. Hi, Julie. And I think that's it. I'd also like to recognize Mr. Larry Ray. You here? Hello, Larry. Glad you're here. Thank you so much. Are you advanced knowledge guests and visitors? Uh, commissioners, you've received, you should have received a copy of the minutes from the September meeting. Do I have a motion for approval? Madam Chairman, I make a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Commissioner Butt. All in favor? Uh, passing the minutes, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion is carried. This time we'd like to, do we have any announcements for the commission? Oh, we can call the roll. We're all here. <laughs> Miss Danette, will you please call the roll? Jimmy Granberry? Here. Tommy Woods? Here. Monty Ballou? Stan Butt? Here. Wally Childress, Here. Bill Cox, Here. Chris Devaney, Here. Chip Saltzman, Here. Steve Jones, Here. Brian McLaren, Here. Kent Woods, Here. Hank Wright, Here. Angie Box. Here. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Danette. Okay, do we have any announcements from the commission? Real quick, uh, just like to thank the Wrights and the Coxes for their hospitality the last two nights and uh, we really appreciate it as always it was great fellowship and food and uh, good time for everybody to get together and we appreciate their hospitality I agree thank you so much any other announcements director max do you have any announcements for today madam chairman i just want to thank dunks unlimited again these are great conservation partners thank them for being our host and thank our region one staff for taking care of us with hospitality Thank you very much. I agree. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I'd like to call on Mr. Mark Thurman to presentation and awards. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's always 
an honor to be to be able to get up here and and recognize all the great work that we have going on out there um, you know I always say that um, I wish the public knew all that went on in providing fishing uh, we got some hard-working folks out there and and it's always just a good chance a good time to recognize folks and so we're going to start with our uh, annual awards and starting with the Technician of the Year Award. Uh, we're recognizing Scotty Webb, who is in the uh, Region 3 Rivers, Streams, and Small Impoundments Fisheries crew. Um, Scotty began his work for the state of Tennessee over 30 years ago. He started out working for the Department of Agriculture in the Division of Forestry. In 1994, he started his work with TWRA. In the early years of his career, he worked a split position. He worked in wildlife and in fisheries, half and half. I think it's important to note when we're talking about Scotty's career that he had a big Im impact on terrestrial habitat management in those early years, warm season grasses, working with private landowners, and uh, I just think that's important to note when we talk about his, about his career. Scotty's provided technical advice to over 50 landowners this past year. Scotty's our point person for assisting landowners with pond management questions. Most of it's over the phone, but sometimes he'll make a site visit and go look at it. Uh, he'll make some stocking recommendations, helps them identify aquatic vegetation species and, and the appropriate uh, treatment for them. Scotty also is a key part in our efforts to manage our stream access sites, and we have a lot of them. Um, he makes a point to visit these sites regularly, and he, he makes note of the signage, keeps our signage up, um, takes care of the grounds when they need to be taken care of, and it's even been noted that uh, he'll clean the place up and keep it looking nice without even, I mean, that's just something he does. He takes great pride in our in our work and the places that we provide access. He advises regional managers, fisheries managers of, of all the condition of these sites and it's been just an important part of his work this year. His work at Fall Creek Falls, which we talked about yesterday, which is a Bill Dance signature lake, has just been exemplary. We currently have eight solar powered fish feeders at Fall Creek Falls that have required a bit more fine tuning than we realized at the start. And <clears throat> Scotty has become our resident expert on the deployment, operation, and maintenance of these feeders. He routinely act interacts with the public and talks with them when he's doing this work and has been quite the ambassador for us. He's conducted krill surveys there, which, which has helped us with insight into the management. And he's also been one of our hardest workers when it comes to putting the habitat out there at Fall Creek Falls. This year he helped us with putting dissolved oxygen probes in the Caney Fork River. We've all talked about the Caney Fork over the last few years and how important that is. And also helped us with uh, assessment of, of uh, trout populations in the river. This is a very important area that, that often goes overlooked here. Scotty serves as the de facto technician for the Region 3 office in Crossville, and he's Johnny on the spot whenever anybody calls him for service. Living close to the office has its advantages, but some would say it has its disadvantages too. He neither complains nor seeks recognition for the extra work that's asked of him, and takes pride to be in being the go-to guy for unloading delivery trucks, moving equipment, running various physically demanding errands, et cetera. The front office personnel are very lucky to have him at the ready when, he, when the need arises. His work over this year and his career have been a benefit to Tennesseans and to TWRA, and we are very grateful for that. And so with that, we'd like to ask you to come up and receive your award.
Okay. If I could have our next slide, please. Our next award is the Fisheries Biologist of the Year Award. And we're recognizing the work of Nathan Warden, who works in Region 1 in the State Lakes Fisheries Program. Nathan began his TWA career in 2006, and he's currently working as a fisheries manager over five TWA State Lakes. Nathan has excelled in the area of catfish management and has created sampling protocols that will help with assessment of those fisheries and stocking efforts, the stocking efforts associated with those fisheries. Nathan's been instrumental in the Bill Dent Signature Lakes work, where his knowledge of the sites and approach to survey work have been advantageous in our efforts. The agency's R3 initiative has been a priority for Nathan. He has supported fishing rodeos, conducted classroom visits, and assisted a variety of outreach and communications activities in the region. He's planned and led survey efforts and has been a key part of evaluating infrastructure and habitat at all of the lakes that he manages, as well as some extra ones. As a commissioned officer, he's conducted law enforcement activities at TWA Lakes, including the newly acquired Lake Hawford. He never hesitates to take on an assignment. Nathan has been called on numerous times to rise to a new challenge. Recently, he volunteered to assist the West Lakes crew in maintaining Gibson County Lake when that crew was shorthanded. Nathan's supervisor describes his work ethic as influencing those around him and as someone that leads by example. Nathan is dedicated, efficient, and a highly valued employee. His work to provide high quality fishing resources is a benefit to the public and our agency. And I'd like to ask Nathan to come up to receive his award. So this year, we've added some different awards. Um, as I mentioned earlier, all the great work that we do out there and our employees are doing, um, it, it, it is, it's become uh, something that we wanted to do in, in, in recognizing lifetime achievement. And um, we have three awards today to present. Our first one is to Rick Bean, who works in Region 4 as a reservoir fisheries technician. Rick began working for the TWRA 48 years ago. He actually began his career while he was in high school, working in a summer program with what was called CETA at the time. He spent 40 years working at Buffalo Springs Hatchery. At Buffalo Springs, he was a leader in developing innovations in trout hatchery management. At transitional times, Rick was given the responsibility of overseeing the operations there, and even after moving to a new position, he was instrumental in onboarding new managers at the facility. Working for the same agency for 48 years is unique, and what's more unique is that Rick has never earned a paycheck from any other employer in his life, yet he still enthusiastically comes to work and gives 100% to all his tasks. Whether it's mowing the grass or serving in a temporary manager role, Rick has always been extremely reliable to get the job done and has con been considered a model employee throughout his career. Over his 48-year career, Rick has used his skills, institutional knowledge, and multiple talents from everything from stocking birds, mammals, and fish to constructing buildings and fish habitat, as well as collecting critical fish data. Without question, Rick has positively impacted his coworkers, work unit, division in the entire agency and its customers the past 48 years. His work with the TWRA will have a lasting positive influence on fishing in Tennessee. So Rick, we'd like to have you come up and receive your award.
Our next Lifetime Achievement Award recognizes Tim Broadbent's work with the TWRA. Tim has worked in TWRA for 36 years. His work in managing reservoir fisheries has been foundational. He was working in reservoir fisheries in the 80s when approaches to monitoring were being developed, and that work continues to influence what we do in the field today. He has represented the TWRA in many professional settings. He has been a longtime AFS member and has always emphasized the value of participation in that organization. Under Tim's guidance, we have seen innovation in managing reservoir habitat, which we all recognize has big impacts on fish and fishermen. Tim was on the front line of the invasive carp issue. He successfully took that challenge on, allocating resources for field work and serving on working groups to address this emerging habitat, all while balancing out what we still had to accomplish as fisheries managers out there in the field. Tim has been a leader in our efforts to incorporate Lake Hawford in the Region 1 Fisheries Program. It's been impressive to see that work that has taken place, and because of Tim's leadership, Lake Hawford's going to be a great fishing site. Tim has been a mentor for so many of us in TWRA, including myself. <laughs> His work will have lasting influence on fisheries professionals and fishing in Tennessee. So Tim, would you come up and get your award? The final TWRA award recognizes Jim's, Jim Habera's work. Jim is, the, is a Region 4 fisheries manager in rivers and streams. Jim has worked as a fisheries professional for over 34 years and with TWRA for the past 24. He's been a leader in TWRA and the trout fisheries management world. He has represented the agency in many professional settings. He has served on the American Fisheries Society Trout Committee for 31 years and has received that committee's Distinguished Service Award. He represents Tennessee on the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture, where he serves on the Executive Committee and Annual Project Review Team. He has been a leader in the efforts to restore Southern Appalachian Brook Trout in Tennessee. In addition to numerous management plans, Jim has been the author or co-author on 11 peer-reviewed publications. He has served as an adjunct faculty member at the University of Tennessee and served on five master's level graduate student committees. His work has not only influenced the management of Tennessee's fisheries, but also its fisheries professionals, and we are grateful for that, Jim. So would you please come up and get your award? So that concludes our TWRA annual awards, but we have another award that we want to give today and a person that we want to recognize, and I'm going to turn the podium over to Jason Henniger to award that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and the Commission for allowing me to come today and present this award. Um, <clears throat> it's an honor today uh, for me to come and present Captain Jake Davis um, with the 2022 Reservoir Fish Habitat Partnership Friends of Reservoirs Award. Uh, this award is given to individuals that go above and beyond to conserve or enhance reservoir fish habitat. Jake is receiving this award for his outstanding leadership of the Tennessee Bass Nation High School and Youth Programs and the Tennessee Bass Nation conservation efforts in their conservation and cleanup efforts since 2017. <clears throat> During the last five years, Jake has led the Tennessee Bass Nation in partnership with TWRA and TVA 
to build and deploy approximately 75,000 fish habitat units. <coughs> Habitat structures and reservoirs such as Douglas, Old Hickory, Percy Priest, Normandy, Thames Ford, Woods, uh, newly acquired Lake Halford, and Kentucky Lakes. He and his army of, of BASS nation anglers have also removed over 100,000 pounds of trash from reservoirs statewide. <clears throat> Jake has obtained approximately $50,000 in grants and private funding to support those efforts. During uh, 2022, Jake coordinated a $250,000 renovation of boat ramp, courtesy dock, and parking areas at Marion County Park uh, on Nickajack Lake, completely through donated materials, labor, and private funding. Most recently, he has developed an adopt and access program for his high school and youth clubs. <coughs> where club members adopt a WMA, stream, or reservoir access, post signage of their efforts to keep that area clean, and throughout the year as they visit uh, those access areas, they, they spend their valuable time cleaning up that area each and every time they, they visit that area. Uh, the leadership and dedication has not only improved reservoir habitat, uh, on waters throughout Tennessee, but more importantly, has provided an example for the next generation of anglers of how to protect and enhance our fisheries resources. Gene Gillen, the BASS National Conservation Director, emailed me yesterday afternoon, and this is, this is what his email said. He said, I wish I could have attended, uh, but an eight hour drive from Oklahoma was not in the cards. I hope that it, <coughs> I hope that it can be noted that Jake was the recipient of our BASS Conservation Director of the Year Award uh, after he had been in the volunteer position only a couple of years, which there's a lot of conservation directors work uh, a lot longer than that, uh, 20, 30 years to, to receive that award from BASS. Um, He is, he is one of the very few conservation directors that I can point to and tell people I wish I could clone him. His drive, determination, organizational skills, and positive cooperative attitude make him a standout among our 47 state conservation directors. He has applied for and received a number of grants and has turned the, the Tennessee BASS Nation High School program into a habitat enhancement machine that is, in, that is the envy of other states. The Friends of Reservoirs Award recognizes all the hard work and, and more that Jake has put into building a truly exceptional program. On behalf of BASS Conservation, I would like to con congratulate Jake on him receiving this award. And on behalf of the Reservoir Fish Habitat Partnership, Friends of Reservoirs, and TWRA, I would like to thank Captain Jake Davis for his service to the fisheries resources and anglers of Tennessee. Jake, would you please come and receive your award? And that concludes our fisheries awards. Thank you, Chief Thurman. And congratulations to everybody. I, I think he made a good point as far as when you, I don't think you realize until you work with these people how incredible and how much of their heart and soul goes into their job. So it's uh, well deserved. So thank you so much and thank, congratulations, Jake. Awesome. Okay, at this point we're going to move into our rulemaking hearings. 
uh, and I'm going to read a st so I'll talk more. I'm going to read a statement continuing the rulemaking hearings. Okay. We are now moving into rulemaking hearings section of our agenda today. I'm Commissioner Chair Angie Box, and I will serve as presiding officer over the rulemaking hearing. The Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission will be hearing three proposed rule amendments and one proposed new rule. It's my understanding that these rules have been publicly noticed consistent with applicable law. They have been filed with Secretary of State's office and they have been available on the public notice section of the agenda's website. Agency staff have copies of the proposal and red line for anyone that would like a paper copy. The order of the proceeding will be as follows. Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency staff will present the information relative to the proposed rule, change, or new rule. I will recognize agency staff member accordingly. Commission members will then be permitted to ask questions or provide comment on the proposed rule. Once the commission members have had the opportunity to speak, members of the public will be permitted to provide comment. All parties should identify themselves before speaking. As chair, I reserve the right to limit comments and discussion, especially in the case of repetition. With the order of proceedings established, I will now ask the agency fishery chief, Mark Thurman, to present the amendment to rule 1660.0105, rules and regulations for fishing. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm presenting to you today 1660.0105, rules and regulations for fishing, and propose the following. We are proposing that in the, our proposals uh, for the rule are revising TWA personnel who can hold commercial fishery quota permit drawings. We're establishing Lake Halford as a TWA lake. We're including Lake Halford in the rules associated with TWA lakes and establishing a requirement of a lake, TWA lake permit for fishing Lake Halford. That concludes the presentation and we ask the committee's commission's approval. Okay, members of the commission, are there any questions or comments? Are there any uh, commission members from the public? Any comments or questions, concerns from the public? Okay. Uh, are we all ready to vote? Okay. Danette, will you call the roll? Okay. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Second, Commissioner Cox. Okay. Jimmy Granberry? Yes. Tommy Woods? Yes. Monty Ballou? Stan Butts? Yes. Wally Childress? Yes. Bill Cox? Aye. Chris Savaney? Chip Salzman? Yes. Steve Jones? Yes. Brian McLaren? Yes. Kent Woods? Yes. Hank Wright? Yes. Angie Box? Yes. Eleven eyes, one absent. Thank you, Jeanette. Okay, rule 1660.0105 uh, passes. Okay, Chief Thurman, would you please present an amendment to the rule 1660-0130, commercial fishing and wholesale fish dealers. Yes, Madam Chair. We are proposing the following amendments to rule 1660-0130, rules and regulations for commercial fishing and wholesale fish dealers. Our first amendment establishes the regional road fish permit a Mississippi River region, a West and Middle Tennessee region, 
in an East Tennessee region. <coughs> the areas covered under those are listed. The next amendment establishes the number of permits that can, that can be held uh, in each year uh, and in the initial year, the number of non-resident permits, which will be three, to be sold on a first come first served basis with no priority annual and only be allowed to choose one region. Uh, it's important to note that in that first year, a person could purchase all three regions, permits in all three regions. Over time, the number of resident permits will be reduced in consecutive years if not purchased by priority permit holders until the set maximum number of permits for each region is reached. Any available permits will be issued through a drawing process. We, the goal for the Mississippi River is 14 permits. The goal for the West Tennessee, Middle Tennessee region is 24. And in the East Tennessee region, 12. Our next amendment to Rule 16-60-01-30 deals with commercial turtle harvest. We currently have a maximum of 33, 35 resident and five non-resident turtle permits issued annually at no charge. They're issued on a first come first served basis. Currently we have about 15 permits annually. Our proposal is to set that number of 35 as a maximum issued annually. Previous Permit holders will have priority to purchase the 35 uh, permits annually. There's a mistake in that slide. It says row permits, but it's turtle permits. Any leftover permits are issued by drawing each year. We will have three non-resident permits available and no priority for permits on those annually. It also establishes a drawing process for any surplus permits that are, that are available in a given year. That concludes my amendments to this rule. We ask the commission's approval. Great, thank you. Is there any comments from the commission? Questions? I have a Commissioner question. Wright. I just have a question for uh, Chief Thurman. Um, on the Mississippi River permits for residents versus non residents, how does that handle? Are Tennessee residents only allowed to fish Tennessee water? Or what happens if somebody from Tennessee launches from Arkansas side or? We have uh, Eric Gaines here, our commercial fishing coordinator. And I would, with your permission, I would like to ask him to come to the microphone to describe that process. That'd be great, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Eric. Eric Gaines, commercial fishing coordinator. Um, if they have a commercial license in Tennessee, they can access commercial waters in Arkansas. We have a reciprocal agreement for that, so, um, and that's been in place for several years. And in Arkansas fishermen, do they have a permit process and they can access the same water? Correct. Okay. Good, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Cox, do you have a question? <coughs> yeah. Um, has this gone through the Commercial Fishing Advisory Committee? It has. They, this they was brought. This. Yes. We have support from the Commercial Fishing Advisory Committee. And I, I think I asked this last month. Currently, we're not excluding any of the commercial fishermen that have licenses now. No. I mean, with this new, there are plenty of licenses in all areas for everybody to get a license. Yes. It's when they don't buy a license that the numbers are reduced. That's when it starts okay. moving towards those target goals. So on the Mississippi River, to follow up with, with Commissioner Wright, we're limiting the number of Tennesseans to 14, but Arkansas could have 50 on the same water. How does that square? Not that they have that many, but they're not limited. So a Tennessee fisherman could buy an Arkansas permit and put in over there and keep fishing, right? Why not, Eric? You shaking your head? Why not? I would like to ask Eric if, if he could come. If you guys, if it's okay with y'all, to have him come back to the sure. mic. Yeah, Eric, will you come to the microphone? Thank you. I mean, I just don't want to limit Tennessee fishermen when they when they can obviously access the water, like Hank said, from Arkansas. 
uh, currently um, uh, the state of um, Arkansas does have commercial fishing on uh, for paddlefish. That's what this is about on the Mississippi River, but they <coughs> they have fishing south of basically Memphis. They don't have any commercial fishermen in that area that that commercial harvest. So we have limited numbers in Tennessee. So it, we we don't perceive there being uh, an issue uh, at this time. Any other commissioner comments or questions? Gary Berry, so, Commissioner Berry. So to, to Commissioner Cox's point, if it became a problem, we could change the rule down the road if they were to have 30 or 40 people fishing. And that's what I think he was trying to address, that they overtake our, our numbers. Well, just like we're amending rules today, um, if we see problems in the future, uh, we would address them. You'll be tracking that, is what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. I'm sure the commercial fishing will bring it back to me, but I'm just hopeful and more excluded about it. It'd be unfair to our fishermen and most of the Arkansas fishermen. And I'd like to add just to that that, um, you know, the Eric's work with the commercial fishing industry and the advisory committee has put us and the people fishing in a, in a good relationship and we'll continue that relationship and, and adapt in the future. Okay, do commissioners have any questions? I'd like to ask if the public has any comments. Clay Young, North American Caviar. Uh, to kind of clarify and clear that up on Arkansas, Arkansas does not allow non-residents, so Tennessee won't sell a non-resident to them, so that's where it doesn't happen. And they have six fishermen on the Mississippi River below Helena. That's it. So. Thank you. Any other commercial? Oh. Yes. How um, about Missouri? Missouri, Missouri. I, he fishes for me. I have one non-resident there, and uh, no Kentucky or anything. So we usually don't have over. I think the permits are about eleven every year. That that's the resident fishermen on the Mississippi River. So it's it's given us a few more spaces there. Any other comments from the commission? Anybody else from the public like to speak or have a question? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve 1660-0130 commercial fishing, wholesale fishing, fish dealers as presented? Motion. Motion, Commissioner Woods, second Commissioner Childress. Okay, roll call vote, Ms. Tanet, please. Jimmy Granberry? Yes. Tommy Woods? Yes. Monty Ballou? Stan Butts? Yes. Wally Childress? Yes. Bill Cox? Aye. Chris Tavaney? Chris Saltzman? Chip Salsman, I'm sorry. <laughs> Steve Jones. Brian McLaren. Yes. Kent Woods. Yes. Hank Wright. Yes. Angie Box. Twelve eyes, one absent. Great, thank you, Danette. Rule. Oh. We're on 1660-0130, commercial fishing, wholesale fish dealers is passed. All right. Chief Thurman, would you now present the new rule for Governing Lake Halford, 1660-0135? Yes, Madam Chair. We are presenting 
the following amendments to 1660-01-35, rules and regulations governing Lake Halford. Actually, this is not amendment. This is establishing the rules. Uh, so it's a, it's a new rule. Is that correct, Council? Thank you. This rule covers the rules and regulations governing Lake Halford. Things such as establishing the past rules and regulations under TWA authority, items that were covered under the Carroll County Watershed Authority uh, as much as we possible were brought over. Um, need to point out that this is going to be an evolving process as, as we manage uh, the lake and the facilities, but that's where we started. Uh, it defines fees and rules for docks and event registration, hours of operation, defines no wake zones, identifies alcohol prohibitions, and no hunting. Could I have the next slide, please? That concludes the presentation, and we request the commission's approval. Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> Do we have any discussion or questions from the commission? Commissioner Grimberry. I, I just think it's really important to note that this agency and this commission is creating better resources for the resource as Tennessee continues to grow. This along, we're later on in the meeting, we'll talk about Catoosa, but as we uh, expend lots of dollars in, in, in conjunction with the, the governor's office and making these improvements for the citizens of Tennessee, I just think it's a really good thing, and I'm happy to be part of it. Thank you, Commissioner Granberry. And members of the public who'd like to speak or have questions? Okay. I have a motion of approval governing Lake Halford Rule 1660 Motion of a second. Second, Commissioner Woods. Uh, Ms. Danette, roll call vote, please. Yes. Tommy Stewart? Yes. Ronnie Ballou? Sam Budd? Yes. Wally Childress? Yes. Bill Cox? Aye. Chris Devaney? Here. Chip Saltzman? Yes. <laughs> Steve Jones? Yes. Ron McLaren? Yes. Kent Woods? Yes. Hank Wright? Yes. Angie Box? Yes. 12 ayes, 1 absent. Great. Thank you, Danette. Approved passage of Rule 1660-0135. For the final rule, I will ask Agency Deputy Director Frank Fisk, please, to present the amendment of Rule 1660-0128. Rules Thank and you. regulations governing license and permit fees. Sorry. Get the slide clicker here. Okay. Yes, this, this is a, we're op opening this rule to, to set the fees associated with the permits you heard in earlier rules. Few things that we're doing. Uh, one major thing is housekeeping. We haven't had this rule open up open in a while. There are some con inconsistencies in license descriptions where it might say a uh, Gatlinburg one day license, and then another one would be a three day teleco license. We moved all the day, the length of the license to the same spot in the description of the license. We also removed the license types. You always hear type 01, type 04. Those numbers have no meaning anymore in the branch system, and we shouldn't really have the public trying to understand a numbering system when we have perfectly good names for our uh, licenses and permits. We've also added the lifetime license for adopted children that are under 13 within three years of adoption. Th this was set in statute, and this is just adding it to our rule. We also renamed the apprentice hunting license as the hunter education exemption. This was creating confusion because it was not really a license, it's just the ability to have a hunter ed exemption. And th this language is changed throughout the document and it needs to be changed on page three where it, on, where it was missed on the red line as well. 
This, we are also changing the opportunity to use this exemption from a one time to uh, 100 could use it three years in a row. We've removed uh, the big game management permit, which has never been sold in the last 25 years. It's a, it's a relic license that we just want to clean up and get rid of. We also are eliminating the resident, non-resident turtle permit because you'll see that we've added, basically we split it into a resident and non-resident version of the same uh, turtle permit supplemental. And lastly, we've created uh, fees for Lake Halford. Uh, the one day permit will be $6. The annual Lake Halford permit will be 48. And really lastly, for the row permits that you just heard about, the, this rule also sets the fees for those. So in each of the grand divisions where there those permits are sold, 1,000 for residents and 1,500 for non-residents. Uh, unless there are any questions, I request commission approval as presented. Thank you, Frank. Are there any comments or questions from commission? Commissioner Wright. Um, Deputy Director Fisk, could you, so we have a Lake Halford permit. Is that different than the TWRA lake permit we talked about earlier? It, it, it is. It's a, it's a standalone for Lake Halford, so you couldn't you, you couldn't buy it and run over to another lake in the same day and use it. The other thing to consider is that at our agency lakes, those are th those are fishing permits, and with Lake Halford, that permit's required for all users. So we felt there's, we felt we needed to separate that out. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Granberry. So so Frank. Um, is a lifetime license holder exempt at Lake Halford, or is this still, he still have to buy a permit? A, a TWA issued lifetime license would, would cover you at Lake Halford. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner so Saltzman. So that would cover you including the Lake Halford permit or yes. just the TWA permit? It would cover all, it would cover the Lake Halford use permit, yes. That, that $6 permit, you would not, if you had a sportsman's license, you would not have to buy the the Lake Halford permit. Life, lifetime? For, and lifetime as well. It's lifetime like is sportsman. Either one. Right. Okay. So Commit. do all of our lakes have one-day permits? Nearly all of them. Are they all $6? They're $6. All six. So it's a regular rate across the board. Got it. Thanks. Um, and I guess I'll, I need to ask the director this. In light of our, <coughs> we're having a budget meeting coming up for discussion uh, if out of that budget meeting perhaps some licenses are adjusted or or combined or anything you could think of after that meeting we would have to open a new rule and take eight months to do it should we consider tabling this rule until another to after these upcoming discussions Council. I would uh, recommend not doing that because that process may take us longer. The, sec the first discussion that you're talking about having. Okay. Uh, and right. my understanding is that because this, this and council can correct me if I'm wrong, but because this is a similar fee that we charge at other places, we can start charging it immediately upon the rule becoming effective. If we increase it, we'll have to wait till the July 1, and we won't be able to start our season at Lake Halford with a permit. Well, I wasn't talking about particularly that. I'm just okay. talking about this is a okay. Well, any, that, any license, but that would be a byproduct. We would lose the ability to collect fees. Okay. Like All right. Just Thank thought you. I'd bring it up. Thanks. For the commission's efficacy in this rule, there's a statute that provides that if the rule is not final and effective 90 days before July 1st, you have to wait to the preceding July 1st. So that's why this rule is timely and um, the agency is requesting this rule go forward as it proposes just simply because there's a statute that has a hard uh, stop on it in collecting the, the fee. Frank, while we're on this topic, just for clarification, with a lifetime sportsman, uh, a lifetime license, not sorry, lifetime license, is there any permit required for fishing or is everything exempt if you have a lifetime license? For example, the trout permit in Gatlinburg, is that a Gatlinburg city permit that 
sort of trump the lifetime license? No, you, the, the Gatlinburg permit would be covered by your lifetime license. So there's really nothing that the lifetime doesn't cover? Boat registration. Well, I understand. Uh, well, the federal I'm just thinking. Stamp, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing that. No. The well, reason I ask is when I, when I promote the lifetime license to folks, I say only thing you'll ever have to buy is a federal duck stamp. And just, I just want to be That's clear accurate. that there's something. They go out and start fishing trout in Gatlinburg thinking they're covered, and then they get sighted. Oh, yeah. For sportsmen, the commercial licenses are on their own. Yeah, on their own I'm talking well. about the lifetime. I don't, but. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the commission? Emily. Frank, can you restate or clarify? You said there are a few red lines that need to be. There Change was a, or adjust it. I just want to make yeah, sure we on, understand on, those. Yes, on, on page three where we reference the apprentice hunter exam, uh, education permit, it should read, it should have been stricken and to say, or changed to say apprentice hunter education exemption on page three under section one. Just for the record, it, it, our intent was to change that, the name of that exemption throughout the document. Okay. Okay, anybody have? Commissioner, have any more questions, comments? Anybody from the public would like to speak? Questions or comments? Okay. Oh, yes. You come, you come to the front. Yes, please. And just state your name. Oh, we know who you are. <laughs> Lisa Holmes. Uh, our biz regional business manager, Region 1. Do the lake, people who live on the lake, have to buy the permit? Lake yeah. Alford? Yes. So everybody has to buy it? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, any further discussion? Okay. Do I have a motion of approval, 1660-01-28? Thank you, Commissioner Grammy. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Commissioner Woods. Okay, Ms. Danette, can you call the roll, please? Jimmy Granberry? Yes. Tommy Woods? Yes. Monty Ballou? Stan Buck? Yes. Wally Childress? Yes. Bill Cox? Aye. Chris Devaney? Yes. Chip Saltzman? Steve Jones? Yes. Brian McLaren? Yes. Kent Woods? Yes. Hank Wright? Yes. Angie Box? Yes. 12 eyes, one absent. Thank you, Jeanette. Okay. Passage of Rule 1660-0128. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Frank Fisk, appreciate it. Now we're going to call on Budget Chair uh, Commissioner Cox, please. Thank you. Yes. Stay there. It's my slide up here. Here we go. So yesterday I presented requests for budget expansions and a redistribution. Uh, y yesterday's discussion was the points are here. I believe the, the commission's amendment would have brought that down to just these items being approved by the budget committee. Is that correct, Chairman? That's correct. Okay. Madam Chairman, the budget committee made that today their recommended approval of the list of already in the list of $120,000 for three committee acquisitions and seven million dollars by appropriation. Second. Second, Commissioner Buck. A motion and a second approval of Ed Carter unit and the Catusa Ridge acquisition. Do I have any discussion? No discussion from the public. Okay. 
All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carried for approval. You could. I have a motion and a second for approval. Any discussion from the commission? Commissioner Wright. Uh, Commissioner Cox, explain that. What are, uh, All right, the two and a half million dollars budget for her parking and work, all that work. Uh, I'm sorry. There's two and a half million dollars budgeted for her Parsons upgrades and and work base and concession, concessionaire building, et cetera, and all of that work cannot begin this fiscal year and the agency's asking to redistribute 1.1 million dollars of that money to go on and start projects that are readily available at other build at signature lakes retaining 900,000 more than the expected cost of what they can get done this year so if they come up with other other things out there that can get done so instead of coming back and asking for a budget expansion for these other projects, we're, they're just redistributing what we've already budgeted for, for her parcel. Got it, and so all the work planned will, will happen, it's just delayed. Th that's you, correct. Yeah. And that's, that's the plan, the, 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 the prices came back when, when, when uh, Chief McClellan got prices were pretty high, like four times higher than we thought. So that there's been a delay hoping those costs will come down and they want to redistribute this money so they can go and start the projects that are ready to go with some of the other lakes. Perfect, thank you. And and just for clarification, there was 500,000 that was going to be spent for Herb Parsons for this year, is that correct? I think that's right. The, yeah, yeah. the team identified about $500,000 worth of projects they could get done this year, and, and that money is certainly there. Second. Commissioner Granberry. So, Commissioner Cox, if the 900 that's remaining, if there's something identified relative to the Bill Dance Lakes for this fiscal year 23, we, we have those 900. The 900 still there. It, right can. now, it's, it's for her Parsons. If they see they could use it for something but else. It's, but if, I guess if they needed it at Pin Oak or somewhere, they could come back to us and say, we need to get some more of that money. We're going to move it Sorry, around. Sorry, we don't have to do a budget expansion. So we don't have to do a budget. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Grimberry. Any other comments or questions? Comments from the public? Okay. All in favor of passing budget expansion <coughs> for Parsons Lake Project, 1.1 million. State, I say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Motion carried. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Frank. Hey, Chairman Cox, do you want to identify the other projects there that we're moving? Catusa? Yeah, the other projects the that, we, that we, the Budget Committee did not recommend uh, for more discussion, the Montgomery County range and the Doe Mountain range uh, for about a million, four or five each, so we can, the R3 committee can can meet, discuss, and and recommend or not recommend uh, some of the for some of the concerns about some of these ranges. So it hadn't gone through the R3 committee. So the consensus was that we let it work through the process before we approved it in the budget. Okay, those will be discussed in January. Uh, I don't know that Commissioner McLaren's committee, so I don't I don't know when. So I mean. The commission could vote to, to approve those today, but the but the budget committee did not vote to okay. to, to approve those. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the commission? Yeah, would uh, Commissioner McLaren like to uh, comment from the R three committee, please? Uh, 
I think the uh, comments from yesterday were that the this would be brought before the R3 committee and go through the new uh, process uh, with the forms to make sure we was all on a level playing field and, and all the ranges would be considered accurately. So does everyone understand that uh, they request a form from the agency and that goes through the committee? Is that my understanding how that works? Or is it online? Director, would you like to explain that better? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. So, Commissioner Butt, we're in the process of completing a form and a proposal. And what that, that will be submitted by anybody that wants to submit a proposal for a range. Uh, that will come into the agency. The agency will rank that, and then we will move it forward to the R3 committee, and then that will require a vote from the R3 committee if they want to move it forward, and then it would go back to the budget committee for approval. So it's my understanding the form is available, but now you said it's still in development, so. <coughs> it, it's, it's not fully complete. Deputy. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that. Chairman, but the, the form is in a near final uh, condition where we were able to share it with anyone that requested it, but we'd like, to, most importantly, we need to establish the line of communications and process to, to make everyone understand that process and identify whose roles and responsibilities it is to shepherd that through the agency. And that, that process is not entirely set up right now. But we would have the opportunity to take the proposals that we receive for Doe, Doe Mountain and Montgomery County and share them in depth with the R3 committee for a vote before the, the January meeting. Staff have already reviewed those proposals and have accepted them. It would be just up for the R3 committee at this point to vote them forward. Thank you. That was my understanding. I just wanted to uh, make that clear so everybody would understand the process of what we're going through. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Commissioner Budd. This time I'd like to call on, uh, yeah, well, let's take a break. <laughs> let's come back at 10.15, uh, please.
Okay, at this time we're moving into fisheries. I will call on Chairman Hank Wright. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, the Fisheries Committee uh, met and would like to um, refer to the full commission for consideration the three proclamations as presented without amendments. Those are 22-10, 22-11, and 22-12. Okay, I'd like to call Mark Thurman, Chief of Fisheries, up here, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are presenting to you today uh, for full commission approval, proclamation, the amendments to Proclamation 2210, Sport Fishing Proclamation. Okay, can we restate exactly yesterday? So you would like for me to walk through the presentation? Okay. Yes, just briefly. I can do that. Um, under section one, general seasons, statewide creel possession and link limits, non-game fish species. This was a housekeeping item, uh, removing pallet and lake sturgeon from the sport fish proclamation. Uh, they are covered under other rule. The next set of, of proposals dealt with big bill dance signature lakes. I would like to take this opportunity to point out that we found an error in our presentation yesterday uh, for Lake Halford. Uh, we have in there a five fish uh, under largemouth bass, a five fish per day, 18 inch maximum size limit. In the proclamation, it is 10 fish per day. So the proclamation is correct and is what we want for management, more, you know, having the, allowing people to harvest fish underneath that 18-inch eight, size limit. Um, so the presentation was incorrect, but the proclamation is. We had regulations proposed for Herb Parsons, Browns Creek, which are all TWA state lakes. We had a set of TDEC lakes, state park lakes, Travis McNatt, Pin Oak, Woodhaven, Acorn, Fall Creek Falls, and then an additional state park lake that's not in the program, Poplar Tree Lake. We proposed a change to the largemouth, smallmouth spotted bass regulations at Douglas Reservoir with a five fish per day in combination year round. Um, with two seasons, a June 1st through September 30th season with a five fish per day with only one fish, large mouth or small mouth, over 16 inches. And an October 1st through May 31st season with a straight up five fish per day in combination. Yesterday we proposed changes to our sport fish trot line regulations. We also illustrated currently how trot lines are defined and the existing regulations around trot line fishing. The proposed changes were to require that trot lines are checked every 24 hours and that they could not extend more than three quarters across any stream, river, chute, or embayment. We also had housekeeping items associated with reservoir definitions. And our example yesterday was for Kentucky Lake, which is defined as Kentucky Lake includes the Tennessee River from the Tennessee-Kentucky state line upstream to Pickwick Dam. And we had an item in there that better described where the boundary between reservoir and tributary streams occurs and are defining that as the reservoir full pool elevation. That concludes the proposed amendments to that proclamation. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions from the commission? Okay, so proclamation 2210, sports fishing from committee chair Hank Wright, presented as, passes presented. Do I have a motion for approval? We're going to ask 
for public comment. We had several comments yesterday. Is there anybody who would like to speak? Okay. State your name at three minutes, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Andrea White with ACA Southeast. Uh, I just have a point of inquiry, a couple of questions, because I really do appreciate the conversation we had yesterday. It was robust, and I appreciate you all for that. Um, but we had a lot of talk about whether there was going to be a 30-day work group on the trot line consensus, uh, and I didn't really hear what the decision was. Um, and so I would really just was asking a point of inquiry on that. And then as a second part to that, um, what would the implication of that be on the printing of the fishing regulations for the year? Chief Thurman, can you respond, please? Well, I think we need to define what that process looks like. Um, we'll certainly have discussions about how that process relates to the timing of the printing of the fishing regulations. I can't describe that today, but I can assure you that we'll look at those two things and look at how they line up and, and, and we'll, we can communicate with you and let you know what that looks like. I would just reiterate for the record that, and to get it in the record, that, that we are very willing, able, and interested in being part of that conversation. We really truly want to be solution oriented and to, to build a solutions based on our shared values about, about sportsman safety across multiple sports. Uh, and I appreciate y'all being open to that and, and we are here and we want to help. So please, please do not exclude us from those conversations. We really do want to be solution oriented. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the public? Okay, I have a motion of approval of Proclamation 2210 Sports Fishing. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor of passage 2210, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passed. Second proclamation 2211, commercial take of fish and turtles. Yesterday we presented proposed amendments to proclamation 2211, commercial fish, commercial take of fish and turtles. Uh, our amendments included opening up for navigation the section of the Mississippi River between River Mile 735 and River Mile 745 for navigation only for commercial fishing. We also identified as an amendment the only paddlefish legal for take were gravid females and that is in, in with the 38 or larger on the uh, outside of the Mississippi and 34 within the Mississippi, sorry. And those were our proposals and we asked for the full commission's approval. Okay, Abby. Commission have any questions or concerns? Any members of the public would like to speak? Okay. All in favor of passage recommending 2210-2211 commercial take of fish and turtles? Aye. Oh, we need a motion. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Jamie. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Commissioner Woods. All in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Chief Thurman, Proclamation 2212. Thank you, Madam Chair. Proc Proclamation 2212 proclaims Lake Hawford as a state fishing area. This is a process by which we categorize a, a property uh, under our management and that is, that is all that this proclamation does is proclaim it as a state fishing area. That concludes the presentation and we ask for the commission's full approval. Okay, do I have a motion for approval of proclamation 2212? So moved. Commissioner Cobbs, do I have a second? Second. Second, Commissioner Jones. All in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Next on the agenda, we have the Legacy Award nomination. Now I'm going to read how this was created from Commissioner uh, Tony Sanders. I'm going to read a little bit about it, and then we can take any nominations from the commission. At an earlier meeting of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission, Tony Sanders proposed the Legacy Award. The proposed of award is to recognize someone of an organization that demonstrates a level of commitment to any of the aspects that TWA and TFWC oversees. There will be no set criteria other than it must be under the preview of Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission. It is expected that the person or persons of the organization nominated by the commissioners would have demonstrated a level of commitment to hunting, fishing, and outdoor lifestyle in Tennessee. It is also anticipated that it will be persons that are not normally recognized for their efforts, although not a requirement. There are many people and organizations that give so much to help promote the outdoor lifestyle. This award is intended to make sure these efforts are not overlooked. Thank you, sir. So we can start with any nominations for the Legacy Award. Okay. Commissioner Cranberry. Uh, at this time, it'd be my honor to nominate Mr. Earl Bentz for the 2022 or three uh, Legacy Award. Thank you, Commissioner Cranberry. Any other nomination? Yes, Madam Chairman, what's the name of the couple at uh, our elk uh, location up in uh, North Cumberland? Lewis. Terry and Jane Lewis. Terry and Jane Lewis, yes. I'd, I'd like to nominate Terry and Jane Lewis for consideration for that award. Great, thank you. Commissioner McLaren. Madam Chairman. I'd like to uh, nominate the uh, the founder of this award, Mr. Tony Sanders. Great, thank you. Any other commissioner nominations? I'd like to nominate Mr. Anthony Landreth. Okay, great. Review those and present the award January meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. We also have the new officer nominating committee today. And this is the nomination committee for our new officers moving in as secretary, vice chair, and chairman. And I'm appointing Commissioner Bill Cox, Commissioner Steve Jones, and Commissioner Hank Wright. And I'd like to call on Director Maxdon. You had some information you wanted to review with us today on a concern from Commissioner Butt. Yes, ma'am. Madam Chairman, yesterday you all had asked uh, questions about baiting, and we had asked to have Chief Joe Benedict come up today, and at this time he's prepared to present you some information on that. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners and members of the public. I um, want to start by thanking the staff that helped me pull, pull this together, uh, especially Communication Director Emily Butt. She helped me with the format of this um, presentation today. We want to share with, some, with you some things that uh, many of the points you, have shared, you shared yesterday about baiting. Uh, primarily, this will be centered around deer. There are other impacts to other game species and other non-game or non-target species um, with uh, the effects of baiting should that occur. Um, Real quickly, there's about four points we wanted to share. Uh, talk about disease issues. As, as was mentioned yesterday, as you are fully aware, uh, we have chronic wasting disease here. There are other significant diseases that impact wildlife that are exacerbated or um, highlighted with, with uh, baiting. Talk about the harvest impacts. Uh, talk about some public perceptions that maybe we don't often think about that, um, that could result from uh, a change in allowance of baiting. And then talk about the existing regulations that you all and, and we as an agency have put on the books and some programs that we've developed um, that baiting would, would kind of relate to. And again, just a note that this is primarily focused today on deer. There are significant other impacts um, that we could share um, at a later date. So we know that deer, uh, that baiting alters the movement of deer, right? That's the reason that folks want to do that, put, put bait out to, to change deer, deer movements. Um, obviously, this congregates the animals in, in a smaller space. Um, 
we have talked at length for the last number of years about um, the spread of disease with chronic wasting disease. Um, there's also brucellosis, bovine tuberculosis. Some other states, Midwest states, deal spend a lot of money um, dealing with these kind of diseases uh, in deer and also in cattle. Uh, we've also talked about aflatoxins or fungus or mold um, in feed that's out there. Um, this can grow quickly. Um, we heard a little bit about that, I think, um, during our season setting process. And actually, on page 27 of the hunting guide, we have a little note to folks um, about aflatoxins and when they think about feeding turkeys or other other critters. Um, and finally, just a reminder that bait not only affects the target species, but non-target species, which also include non-game species. So songbirds and other animals uh, could come to the bait pile. Again, we're concentrating animals on an unnatural situation. Um, it also brings out uh, mesopredators, raccoons, skunks, foxes, those things. They're coming because there are food sources there for them. Um, that are there to eat the bait, so they're there to eat the critters. So again, there's, there's second and third order impacts here to the congregation of animals around bait piles. Um, turning to the harvest impacts, you know, the reason uh, folks want to put bait out there is, uh, you know, their expectation would be to increase the harvest of animals and also, in some cases, increase the trophy quality of those animals. Um, there's some recent literature on this. There's a long history of, of research uh, going into this. Uh, there's a few pieces I want to share with you today. Uh, again, we, we've, we've got documented studies that show that baiting op, uh, alters the distribution of deer, also their habitats, or their habits rather. Um, uh, one study in Georgia just from 2021, the home range uh, di of deer did not change, and that's kind of the big area where within a year they'll, they'll move in and around uh, a certain area. But the space use within that range um, shrunk uh, when you put bait out in there. Uh, we also know that deer move less during the day when there's bait out there. That's from a, a study from the 90s. They move more at night. Uh, and then also uh, a study that was also done in 21, younger bucks were found to use bait more than older bucks. Again, if you go back to the, what the expectations of the hunters would be for doing this, uh, that's really the opposite of what the effect uh, could be. Uh, there's also a neat study in Michigan and Wisconsin. That, you know, they talked to hunters who, who could who hunted in places where bait was allowed and was not allowed in Michigan and Wisconsin. And these are hunters reporting their success. Uh, and they said they had better success in non-baited areas. And I believe some of those states have had baiting for a while. So again, that's not a scientific study. That's, uh, those are hunters uh, being surveyed, asking what they thought about bait. Again, thinking about the reason why people would want to bait. Um, commissioners, you all remember in 2015, you reduced the buck line buck bag limit from three to two. Um, we shared this very slide with you at the, um, at the season setting meetings um, this past year. If you look at, um, there's two uh, lines there, a black one and a purple one, uh, the yearlings and the fawns, the harvest, the percent of harvest of those younger deer are going down. They've gone down since 2015. And the two and a half, three and a half, and older bucks, uh, the percent of the harvest of those older <laughs> animals is going up. So the action that you all took in 2015 is actually having a positive increase. We can actually see that in the harvest um, where people are selectively shooting, shooting older bucks. And again, this is without bait. So things are moving in the right direction for deer hunters in Tennessee, uh, thanks to your action in, in 2015. I've got, I've got no slide movement here, Scott. There you go. Thank you. Um, also, we wanted to just share some misalignment with an allowance for baiting uh, with existing regulations that we have and also programs that we have. Um, as was mentioned yesterday, TCA 70, uh, Chapter 70 prohibits baiting in Tennessee. It's a longstanding uh, uh, rule, uh, law rather. Uh, commission, you also passed a rule in the last couple of months ago. This rule is was passed by the commission, but it's still uh, under review in the AG's office. But um, this change uh, not just affects baiting, but feeding. So you all prohibited feeding uh, of wildlife west of the Tennessee River um, to address chronic wasting disease. So a big portion of the state um, not, not only has a baiting prohibition, but a feeding prohibition. Again, to address this a very important disease issue that we're facing. Um, throughout the time we've had chronic wasting disease, uh, we've done a lot of public education. We've, we've done a lot of informational meetings. Dan, Dr. Dan Grove is here, a wildlife veterinarian, um, works with Extension. Um, they've had, I, I don't know how many meetings, probably 50 or more meetings, maybe even way more than that, um, since we've had CWD. We're talking about trying not to feed animals, not to congregate animals um, as a disease. 
uh, issue uh, specifically around chronic wasting disease. So there's a lot of input um, and information that we've been putting out there for years about not concentrating animals and why we wouldn't want to do that. Uh, you also are very familiar with nuisance bears and the issues that they have. There's garbage issues. Um, they would be attracted to bait. Feral hog issues, you know, we're trying to reduce the number of feral hogs. Um, there's also impacts to, uh, again, other non-target species. We know turkeys are very susceptible to bait. Um, if you go back historically to the, the decline of turkeys um, when, you know, when we first settled <laughs> America, um, turkey baiting, you know, there's a lot of turkeys harvested over bait. Quail, you, get, you all have uh, funded a lot of quail uh, research and um, habitat work. Uh, quail be susceptible to bait. They're also susceptible to those mesopredators uh, at the bait sites. Uh, we're continuing to deal with high path even influenza. Um, that's an area that uh, obviously uh, baiting for waterfowl is prohibited by federal regulations uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and again, to, to not concentrate those animals um, is the best, the best management practice there. And again, non-game birds. You'd have small birds being attracted to, um, to bait piles. Again, the predators are there. There's a chance for disease transmission um, and all of those, those negative things that we talked about with bait. And here's a, here's a piece we wanted to share with you, just some thoughts about public perception that, that maybe aren't at top, top of our mind when we think about baiting. Um, there's this idea of fair chase. You know, most Americans are non-hunters. I think that's a safe statement to say. Uh, Mark Duda, who runs Responsive Management, who did our license um, project a few years ago, he, was, he shared some results with us at Buffalo Ridge. So Mark Duda and his group in 2019 um, did a nationwide study and basically showed that the majority of Americans uh, oppose hunting over bait. Again, going back to this fair chase um, idea. Um, the public disapprove, obviously, of, of unfair, unethical hunting. Um, a lot of people are apathetic to hunting, um, but we don't want to move them from a non-hunter to an anti-hunter, and that's maybe just pause there for a minute. There's a, there's a real perception or, or possibility, rather, that, that folks could, could do that. If they, if they don't oppose hunting, they don't really care for, they don't participate, that's very different than someone who's not, not for hunting, that's an anti-hunter. And again, we could, we could see that um, with this idea of, of baiting and, and ethics. Uh, another related piece, um, you know, Dr. Grove has got some experience in the Midwest, has seen some of this firsthand. Um, you've got conflicts and competition between landowners, particularly small landowners. If you've got four or five acres, you put a lot of corn out and your neighbor doesn't, you know, you just be become, uh, I want my pile of corn bigger or my pile of beets as, as Dan has seen out west. So it creates conflicts and competition, uh, things that, that we don't want to cause infighting among hunters. Um, and also it's universally prohibited, I use that little asterisk there in the beginning, on public lands. Uh, almost across the country, even in states that do allow baiting, it's not allowed on public land. So again, just something to think about with public perception, fairness, equity, and ethics, uh, and this idea of fair chase. So in summary, you know, Tennessee has a long-standing prohibition of baiting, right? And that's a great, a great place for this state to be. A lot of other states have succumbed some recently uh, to political pressure, social pressure, and you know, other things to allow baiting. Um, this is scientifically sound. Um, I shared just a few pieces of science here. There's a, there's a, a wealth of information uh, scientifically and research papers published, peer-reviewed, that talk about the issues around, around, um, around baiting and also feeding. I mean, you can put all those together. Uh, it protects, w this, this prohibition pr protects wildlife in ways we've mentioned and, and some we haven't. Again, <clears throat> baiting would not just affect the, the species that you want to bait or you want to target, in this case, deer. Um, it also aligns with best management practices for all kinds of diseases. Uh, we mentioned uh, brucellosis and other diseases. Um, specifically, um, the agency, as you all know, uh, we try to follow the uh, AF or the Association of State Fish and Wildlife Agencies best management practices for CWD. In there, um, it, it talks about not feeding and not baiting for ant for deer. Uh, so we've got disease in general, we've got CWD specifically, and also the Wildlife Society, which is the professional uh, organization, the national professional organization that, that many of us are certified through uh, and belong to. Um, there's an issue paper they have, there's a 2006 um, um, working group that was formed, and we can share that information with you, that really just aligns with where Tennessee has been for a long time and continues to, to remain, um, all of those you know, pieces outside of Tennessee kind of align with that. So, and also again, it would avoid this public criticism of hunting, per perhaps moving these uh, non-hunters to anti-hunters. And so for those reasons, uh, we recommend that there be no change to the prohibition of baiting. Uh, our general counsel uh, 
also mentioned yesterday, maybe it was a commissioner, that uh, the commission doesn't have sole authority to act on this. You could certainly, um, um, you know, provide input on this, but it w it's a TCA code, and I don't know what it takes to change that, except obviously the General Assembly. So I have Dr. Grove here. He drove all the way. He was in UT yesterday evening with some students, so I appreciate Dr. Grove coming. Um, he's here for disease uh, questions, uh, and just um, at the pleasure of the chair, we could take questions. Uh, I'd be happy to answer some if I can. If not, I'll call Dr. Grove to the podium. Thank you for the opportunity. First of all, I want to thank you for that extent amount. Of, I don't know if you slept last night at all, but that was short term, quickly turn around. Thank you so much for gathering information, you and Emily Buck. Chairman Box, I'd like to make a comment too. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I'd like to thank Chief uh, Benedict and, and Emily for pulling this together on such short notice and, and, and due diligence. And I'd like to recommend to the agency to either develop a white paper uh, following up with this or some type of uh, format that we could post that on our website so that everybody could understand that we're seriously concerned about this and that uh, the statistics and the science behind what's been done uh, gives us some uh, background and validity for the recommendation of no change here. But uh, to let everyone know that, that we have done our due diligence in, in looking at that and trying to move forward with the recommendation uh, that would benefit not only our state but the surrounding states that are going to uh, incur uh, consideration as to how they address CWD as well as some of these other diseases. Now, thank you again, Chief, for that and for Emily, and I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Commissioner Butt. Other comments? Chuck Yost. Yeah. Well, just wanted to voice support for, for the policy uh, that's consistent with the best management practices for chronic waste and disease. Any other discussion from the commission? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go a step further. Um, I'm going to make a motion that we, as, I don't know the, whether it's the opinion of the commission or a resolution by the commission, that this commission opposes any change to the baiting laws, and, and we take a stand now. I, mean, I can argue both sides of ethics. I can argue, you know, plenty. I've hunted states with baiting and all that. You know, it's it's the disease spread, and the fact that baiting is just plain lazy. I'm sorry. You just, if you can't get out and hunt, it's just more like shooting. So my, I, I'd move that the commission take a stand and we resolve that we're against baiting for all the reasons that the agency has, has, has given us. You have a second from Commissioner Woods. Any other discussion? And Commissioner Cox, are you, that is for, restate the motion for the agency as well, that's just, just that's for just, every. That's just the opinion of this commission. Sure. No non-binding sure. resolution okay. that, this, that this commission resolves that, that it is against baiting for all the reasons the agency has stated. And of course, Commissioner Woods, If, if I'm hearing it right, this is just a, a consensus vote to be reflected That's in right. the minutes. Okay. It's, 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 it's our determination is, is the majority of the unanimous of the commission that no change is that it's the only way. Mr. Taylor, did you have a question? I, I, I did. I said so. This is just a consensus vote to be reflected in the minutes, just for, just for clarification. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. We were for council. We. All right. All in favor? Aye. Say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion carried. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Thank you, Chief Benedict. Then I'd also like to ask Emily or whoever is going to bring this together. Since there is no prohibition or no rules against feeding, 
that we try to educate the public on uh, what's being done by them. Uh, and I know everyone has certain areas and in, in, in Murray County, we've got lots of people who feed turkeys and feed deer and, and everything that, that if they're going to do that with no prohibition, then they need to understand that spreading of the feed is, is a much better application than piling it up. So uh, if we note that and, and have something uh, in writing or where they go to understand that, and that can be a part of education and promoting, I think, to the public uh, from that standpoint, if that would be uh, if that would be consideration to do that, Emma. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Black. Okay, any more announcements? Director Maxwell and anybody have any? No, ma'am, Madam Chairman. Okay. At this time, the commission needs to convene for an executive session. We have two matters that are privileged and, and confidential we need to handle. I'll need members of all the commission. Uh, the audience, you're welcome to stay or be dismissed. And after the executive session, we'll come back to adjourn. So at this time, I'll need all commissioners and No substitute. Okay, no substitute information. So we will convene. I'll need uh, the members. I need to come with us is Mike, Mike Bell, uh, General Tory Grimes, Emily Buck, Frank Fiss, Brandon Ware, and Randy Tarpey. Madam Chair and Director Maxidon would recommend that we move to the room where we had lunch yesterday down the hall for that yes. meeting. We'll return shortly to adjourn.
Hello, welcome back. So we have a motion to adjourn. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Granberry. Second from Mr. Chip Saltzman. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? Okay, motion carried, we're adjourned. Thank you.